<laughs> All right, so we are talking today about the next page in the packet. It's day three, and it's about uh, sequences. All right, so the sequences problems can be as easy as this. They'll give you the formula, and then what's going to happen if I did this formula? 1 plus 0.5. Would it go up or down? Up. What percent would it go up? Not 5%, 50%. You go up 50% each time, and then is that called growth or decay? Growth. Growth. What kind of growth is it? Is it stable, like flat growth, or is it exponential growth? Exponential. And if it was just adding 0.5 each time, or adding 5 each time, it would look like this. Then the graph would just go up 5 every time, and that would be linear kind of growth. So if I graphed it, it would start at 20 and just go up 5 each time. It would be flat. But if it does what I showed before, it goes up 50%. And that means it wouldn't be flat, would it? It would be a curve like that. That's exponential kind of growth. All right. I would like you to write me an equation that's kind of like this. And remember when you do that you're uh, allowed to change that to be anything you want, and then it, that's convenient. Zero is a good choice, except if they give you a year. Like in the year 2003, they accounted how many uh, bats there were in the cave. <clears throat> and then they had to uh, figure out if it grew or shrank over time. Well, if they give you a year like that, you could put that here. I'd like you to write an equation for this. Your mom's thinking about buying a Camry, a Toyota Camry. And... Uh, she uh, goes to the uh, Camry store and finds out that they are running at about $20,000 for a Toyota Camry. She hears that they typically decline in value over time. And she figures that uh, they're going to go down about 5% each year. And she wants to know if it's currently 2011 what will her car be worth in the year 2020? This is just an equation. All I ask you to do is write me an equation for it. Don't have to solve it. I'll say the question again. It's currently the year 2011. Your mom's going to buy a $20,000 Camry, and she wants to know what it's going to be worth if it goes down 5% per year in the year 2020. All right. I hope you wrote this. U sub 2011 is equal to 20,000. U sub n is equal to U sub n minus 1. Please stop talking. Thank you. Uh, times 1 minus 0.05. Raise your hand if you had that one right. Okay, good. Do you remember at one point we knew how to enter these into a calculator? It's under a different mode than normal. We want to go into sequence mode. Grab your graphing calculator. Find the mode button. The fourth thing down, I think, is a choice. And you want an SEQ, or stands for sequence mode. Get it into sequence mode. And when, so I'll pause here until you get that ready to go. And then enter this into that calculator. All right, so I've got my graphing calculator here. And I'm going to uh, get it into sequence mode. I hit enter. Sure now it's in sequence mode. I hit the y equals screen. And n min means, remember, n is the smallest numbers. They're like the numbers down here. These are the n's. All right? So n min is that's the smallest number that's down there. So i got to put not a 1. That's what the default is, but I want it to be 2001. So the top number here is 2011, I'm sorry, not 2001. 2011 is the current year. Then it says u sub n is given by u sub n minus 1. I don't know if that will work. Let's try this one. Uh, and i got to get this to be a little u there. That's right above the 7. So I go u, and I have for parentheses, that's the sub, n minus 1. 
Remember that's back to this button. N minus one. Enter, and then I gotta have a times. You actually, I think if you just put parentheses right next to it, it would know it was times. One minus point oh five. Then the parentheses. And then this number here is it's gotta know how much she paid for the car somewhere. That's where I put that in. Twenty thousand is what it's worth right now. And I hit enter. And then I go to I personally like to do these this way. If I quit out and get to this screen, now I can just say I wanna know you sub two thousand twenty. Or sorry, twenty twenty. Two O two O in the parentheses. Enter. All right. If yours says error, you entered something different than I did on your screen. Oh yes, you did. All right. Twelve thousand six hundred four dollars. Okay. Now I'll help you try to find it. Look on the screen here. I think most people make their mistake by using a negative sign instead of a minus key, like this little thing right there. It looks like a minus sign, but there's minus and there's negative. Make sure it's not that. You want the minus key. All right, and if it's not that, then you did something else different because the calculator doesn't just randomly not work. The only other thing I can think of is if you have a plot on and up at the top here, the plot one, plot two, or plot three, if that's darkened in, then that means that it's trying to do a plot at the same time and it won't like that. Okay, get up onto the, if, you're, if you have a plot on, get on top of the plot that's on and hit enter and it'll turn that plot off. <laughs> okay. I will help people one-on-one -on -one with this later. Right now, I'm going to move on because otherwise it takes forever and only one person gets uh, any satisfaction out of what they did wrong. Okay. So, what did we figure out? We figured out basically that mom's car is going to go down in value, Right. And by the year 2020, it's still worth something, but it's worth about half as much as it was, right? Okay, less than half. So, that means that she got nine years of use out of the car, right? From 2011 to 2020, she got nine years of use for about $10,000. Okay, so that's around $1,000 a year for using the car. That's pretty normal. That's actually real world. That kind of is... Now, that's for a fairly cheap car. Toyota's uh, Camrys are kind of a, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice car, but it's not like a, you know, expensive car. If you were uh, using a really expensive car, you could be paying more like five or $6,000 per year to use that car. Um, so, anyway, it depends on, the, on how, what your budget is. Some people can afford that, and they can get a really nice car that costs a lot per year. But what's really kind of dumb is if you and somebody else both get the same kind of car, but one person ends up paying like twice as much for it than the other person does. Let me give you an example. I ran an, the numbers on a lease the other day. It was a lease for a Toyota Camry. Uh, and it was, here, here's the basics. It was like around $350 a month for 48 months, as in you're leasing it for, how, how long is that anyway? 48 months. Four years. You're leasing it for four years. It's three fifty a month, and then they also wanted upfront money, sixteen hundred and fifty dollars due at signing, and that's to, you know basically takes care of tax and all that other stuff. Okay, so let's let's uh, actually figure out how much would you really pay. So take your calculator, figure out how much grand total they pay in payments. You know three fifty a month for forty eight months, and then add this on. It's a one time thing at the beginning. Just so give them a second. Let people type that in. They can handle it themselves. Because you could, I could see any of you in this situation. You're going to have to someday buy a car, and you'll be offered like a lease. This is a lease deal. So grand total, what'd you get? All right. So you get to use the four the car for four years, and you pay eighteen thousand four hundred fifty dollars total for that. Three fifty a month. 1650 do it signing. That's a very typical kind of a deal. Well, what's bad about that? All right, that's another way to think of it. Here's one way to think of it. After four years, you have to give the car back, right? You don't get it. You don't get to keep it anymore, right? 
What if you just bought the car for $20,000? After four years, you could sell it and get a lot of money back, right? I mean, in this scenario, after four years, you spent $18,000 and you got nothing to show for it because you got to give the car back. In the other scenario, you spent $20,000 to buy the car. That's what they cost new, around twenty. They like twenty three, but then they have dealer rebates and everything, so it's like around twenty thousand. So, if you spend twenty grand, and you get to keep the car after four years, versus eighteen grand and you get nothing, well, it all depends how much is the car worth. Let's figure that out. Use that same thing you had in your calculator, and tell me four years later, which would be the year two thousand what? Two thousand fifteen. How much is your car worth? So you spent, on the lease, you spent 18450 versus spending 20000 But then you get back when you sell your car. How much is it again? So how much did you really spend if you bought the car? So hold on. And you're right. That's a good point. If you bought the car, twenty grand minus 16290 Gives me, get somebody subtract that, please, and give me. So for four years of use, they paid three thousand dollars. For four years of use, they paid eighteen thousand dollars. You see what I'm saying? So now that's not a completely, completely fair comparison because this one I think has taxes built into it. Uh, whereas you have to pay tax on your twenty thousand dollar car, which makes like an extra thousand dollars. But it's you know, so add a thousand to this, and it's still no big deal. You're not going to have anywhere near the eighteen thousand. Okay, so I know it's not a perfect. If anybody listening at home is a car sales guy, I know this isn't exactly perfect. Um, but one argument that a kid made in class just a second ago it says, "But some people can't afford. They they can afford the payments like this." But they could never afford to pay twenty thousand dollars up front. That's true. That's a very valid point. Some people just don't have twenty grand sitting around, and so they can't go buy the car new. They have to do something that's got payments. So then that is another instance where kind of uh, it, there's an advantage to people that uh, have money is they can get better deals sometimes on things like this. They can have they have the twenty thousand in the bank, so they'll end up having to only spend, you know. Three thousand dollars or whatever. Now, one more thing: we were going to the assumption that the cars depreciate five percent per year. Sometimes they depreciate more than that, so then your car isn't going to be worth as much. But I can tell you this right now: I did look at uh, a bunch of four-year-old cars just to make sure this wasn't way off, and they're in that neighborhood. I mean, a four-year-old car is probably worth about sixteen thousand dollars, so that's you know it's about right. So it could be depreciating more than that, though, in bad times. But um, still, it's a huge difference. I'd rather pay three three thousand than eighteen thousand. It's crazy. That's the way it works a lot in life. Yeah. He, what the comment was: the person that uh, has less money ends up paying more. It's kind of cruel. Seems like the person that has more money should pay more. But. Uh, a lot of times, if you're forced to buy things on payments versus paying for it up front, it makes a big difference. The one situation where pretty much everybody has to usually take out payments is uh, to buy a house because it's just too much money. When you come out of college, if you want to buy a house, you can do that. And your first job that you get, I mean, I did that. I got a teaching job. And then one year, like I worked for one year first to save up some money. And then I got my house right away when I was a beginning teacher. Um, you can do that. But you do pay more because you pay payments. Like I know that I probably paid like thirty thousand dollars in interest in on my house, but I paid my house off kind of fast. But it cost me an extra thirty thousand. But who out there has like a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars sitting around to just buy their house with? You just can't do it unless you got a really wealthy family that's willing to buy you the house, and that's a whole different situation. So anyway. So there's, I don't think there's anything wrong with, you know, you do have what you have to do. If you have to, to make payments on a car, then that's what you have to do. But you have to know that you're paying extra sometimes uh, where it would have been a much better deal if you had had the money. So what, what I would say is it happens a lot is people like me looking for to buy a car 
have to make a decision and maybe I wait a while and drive my old crappy car for a while until I've saved up enough to do it the cheap way. You know what I mean? If there's a way that's better, if I save up the money, then I can do it the smarter, cheaper way. If I'm like, I want the car now, then I'm going to have to pay the more expensive route because I can afford 350 a month, but maybe I haven't saved up the 20000 yet. So sometimes you make choices in life like that too where you have to decide, do I want the instant, like I want it now, I want it, you know, want the pretty thing right now even though I can't afford it. And if you do, you can usually get it, but it'll cost you way more than if you can be patient and save up. Okay. So when you have uh, problems today, they're going to be a lot like those. I want to make sure you remembered how to put them into your calculator. One more thing that, that uh, threw a lot of kids for a loop was if they give you the numbers, the car is going from 20000 up to, uh, and, and could a car actually go up in value? Yes, they can. Like recently, used cars just went up in value. From the last year to this year, I was just hearing about the actual numbers. It's like about a 10% increase in the value of used cars just over the course of the last one year. It's kind of weird. Used cars have become more scarce. There's less people that are willing to sell their car and buy a new one. See, what makes used cars is if people are buying a nicer one and they get rid of their other one, right? That's how a used car comes onto the market is because somebody had it and bought a nicer one. Well, if people are being more careful right now with their money because there's a recession and some people are losing their jobs and stuff, then they aren't buying as many new cars. And if they aren't buying as many new cars, then that means there aren't used cars because if you're you have to have a car, or at least most people do, and so you're going to be driving around that old car longer, and so there's less used cars. When there's less of something, their price goes up. All right, so if you have these two numbers, and they ask you what percent did it go up, a lot of people divide these wrong. You should take this one and divide by that one. Take the 21000 and divide it by the 20000 and see what percent did the car go up in value. How much? 1.05. So the car went up in value 5%. Do you get what I'm saying? And you take the bigger one divided by the smaller one to tell what that increase was. All right. Uh, another uh, type of problem. Grab your packet, everybody, and let's uh, look through it together here. There are on day three... Um, turn it to the page that looks like this, and it's it says uh, number three at the top. It says, imagine the graphs generated by them. They list a bunch of words there. Arithmetic, geometric, linear, nonlinear, increasing, decreasing. All right. So if I have a graph, and it has a straight line, that could be described in two ways. The fact that it's a straight line means linear. If it was curved, you'd say nonlinear. Okay? The fact that it's going up as I read from left to right means that it's what? Increasing. If it was like this, that's not only nonlinear, because it's a curve, but it's decreasing. Okay? All right. Uh, and then there's geometric versus arithmetic. Geometric is the kind where you multiply or divide by something, and that those are the ones that end up with curves. So if it's a curve like this, that's a geometric. If it's flat, like the black line there, if it's a flat, even if it's growth or decay, it doesn't really matter, that is a arithmetic. And this one, the red one, is a geometric. Okay. All right, last thing I want to talk about is uh, domain. The domain of the sequence. Domain. Is going f this way. It's your X numbers. Of course, then, range is the, the Y numbers. Okay. So if I was asking about the domain of a function... 
All right. Then I would be uh, asking you, for instance, on one of these, for the x number. Well, what the heck is the x number? I don't see any x in this whole thing. Well, there's x and there's y. Would you agree that at time 0, I have 20? You see that? Does this kind of look like it would be a point, then, on the graph? 0, 20? So this is the x number. This is the y number. So this are your x numbers on your graph, and these are the heights or the y numbers on your graph. So this, the numbers down here, are the ones that tell you your range. And your numbers over here are the ones that tell you... I just did that wrong, didn't I? X is domains, sorry. Domain are those guys, and these are the range numbers. So if I ask you the domain and range of this sequence, I'm asking you the domain, what is the smallest that it ever is, comma, what's the biggest that it ever is? It goes from zero to infinity, very good. Now, but wait, if I do it with parentheses like this, that means it's never zero and it's never infinity, but it actually is zero, so it'd be a bracket. You remember this? This is called interval notation. You're going to do that a lot next year. If it's got a bracket, it means it can be that. It can be zero. See, it is zero. It's right there. And it never will be infinity. Infinity always has a curve around it. Okay? Range. The range is from what's the smallest that it'll ever be? 20. Because it's only going up, right? So it goes from 20, which it can be, so I use a bracket, all the way up to what's the biggest it could ever be theoretically? Infinity. And a curve. All right. It's about lunchtime.